Is it possible to streamline this entire operation by removing these air pumps down here? Hmm. That was the question I heard when I read Emily's comment here on Discord. And in this old video, I experimented with the idea of using the really cold gas starting at the top of a radiator system or starting at the bottom of the radiator system to cool down polluted oxygen. And it was in that experiment I remember that if a gas goes into a liquid, it becomes a vacuum and will actually draw all of the gas back down. So that was the concept that hit my brain when I read that comment. And here's all the crazy steps I had to go through in order to make it a reality. So welcome back my fellow duplicants. Today I'm going to be generating even more power with this already ridiculous power plant down here. And that is simply because we're going to be using up less power. So the peak amount that we're actually going to be generating is still going to be pretty much the same. We're simply going to reuse less of it in the process here. So let's start with a graph. I've enhanced it a little bit from the last video here. And in that last episode, we were able to generate uh, an average of 12,000 kilojoules per cycle. But only 63% of that was actually making it out of the power plant because 37% of that was used on pumps and all the other equipment that was actually used to generate the power. And this average was set from here back, so not all of that. So here we have it. This was my first prototype here of trying to make this area very simple. So what I'm trying to do here is go from crude oil, make that into petroleum, make that petroleum into sour gas, cool that sour gas back down into liquid methane, and then pump that into the other chamber here, which is where we actually use the pumping station to get this into the pipes. You still need those pumps no matter what. So once it gets down here, that that liquid then heats up and turns into natural gas, and that's how that happens. So. I tried to make this as simple as possible and you can see that it didn't necessarily work out here. The main things that I ran into here is that the liquid blocks the gas that might form up here from going down there. Now I do have a pump to kind of work that a little bit, but it's also very hard to control just how much liquid is down there. The other thing I'm experimenting here is the difference between co-current and counter-current in this setup. So what that is, is co-current here is actually going to bring in the coldest liquid next to the hottest gas in our system. And that's going to drive the temperatures closer together over a shorter period of time, essentially. So this is just going to happen much more rapidly. Countercurrent actually brings in the coldest at the back here versus the hottest over there. And the two temperatures actually more gradually change down. It's actually very interesting in that, um, ideally, I would think the co-current would be the design that we'd go with. But as it turns out, the countercurrent is actually the one that ends up working. So my first design iteration here was to really redesign the top end of this system up here. So this is actually going back to what I had previously because that actually seemed to work out really, really good. So I'm bringing in the crude oil over here and this heats up and it goes through a little bit of automation to determine just how much is, is flowing out of this system. I'm also checking the temperature on each loop here so that I can use a little bit of automation here to kick the, the super coolant out if I wanted to bring it out at a lower temperature. Since each one of these feeds the next one, I can actually drive that temperature down quite a lot since each one's going to drop 15 degrees Celsius. So I could potentially see a temperature drop of 75 degrees Celsius from here to there. But the thing is, if it hits absolute zero, then it's just going to consume power and it's not going to get any colder. And yes, this is very, there's a lot of video game science that we're going to be having tonight. There are some bits that are kind of real legit like this, but at the same time, there's a lot of video game that's going on. So don't try to apply science too much <laughs> anyhow super coolant is flowing through here and i can go ahead and throw that out as well you can also see that i switched the flow up down here from co-current to counter current and what we could see is that this is actually condensing this gas quite a bit as it turns out this system would actually jam up when i was running the liquid the opposite direction and I believe why that was is because if I ever overcame the coolant capacity of what I have here, the rest of it would kind of even out. So the temperature change is happening so rapidly, everything just ended up pretty much the same temperature down here, which wasn't enough to actually uh, condense it into a liquid. For whatever reason, it would just run very sporadically. Whereas running this backwards like this actually almost combs the gas from the bottom up and once it reaches a liquid, then everything drops down. Now, while this looks like it's working absolutely great, it isn't actually efficient at all. But the reason why it wasn't efficient wasn't really clear to me to begin with. The other thing I should mention here is I'm now using steam turbines up here to 
cool these thermal aqua tuners because sometimes they generate more power than I can pull out of them. So I got to just keep that temperature down. This way I get a little bit of power out of this and I also control the temperature of the aqua tuners so that it just don't get too hot. You can imagine if this gets super hot up here since it is the same chamber, um, the delta that we're dealing with right here is, is pretty extreme and it just gets even more extreme. I have had some cases in doing this where this has gotten so hot up here that the super coolant became so hot that it actually burst the pipe. One of the other things I have to deal with here is taking this liquid and turning it back into a gas. So you can see what I'm doing over here is I'm actually pumping this liquid over here and then I'm, I'm running it across a couple of space heaters. I did look at using a liquid tepidizer, but it, unfortunately the amount of liquid that I need to submerge a liquid tepidizer was just too much. Although I'm sure I could potentially submerge some other liquid on top of the tepidizer to make that work. But you know what? The space heaters actually worked out pretty good and they're fairly low power too. So that's what I was doing to solve this system right here. But unfortunately, it never actually ended up being stable. So I wasn't able to get any numbers out of it. All right, so this is my second design iteration. And what I did here is I changed from having a huge loop into a very small loop down here. This is just too wide. And the other thing is I'm also using a little bit of a metal tile here that's exposed to the hotter gas up here, the sour gas. And that is in turn how I'm going to flash the liquid into a gas down here. So as I'm pumping it out, it should hopefully turn into a gas and, and whatnot. Now, while this design does work, and I think it works a little bit better than the previous system, it doesn't really ever become stable or efficient as well. It doesn't even become self-powering. But again, it didn't become apparent to me what was going on here until this next system that I had designed. Except for this time, I explored a little bit more with pre-cooling right here. So I used just a bunch of temperature shift plates to see what would happen if I dropped that temperature up here. And as it turns out, this one actually ran worse than the last one, which was totally weird and I didn't understand why. Well, as it turns out, I finally discovered the problem down here, and that's because rather than getting a lot of liquid methane, I was getting a lot of solid methane. Now this here didn't really make a lot of sense to me because if you go back to like the previous system, I have a lot of radiant pipes and all of that stuff in the exact same chamber as the sour gas, and it's not generating solids at all, whereas this one is, which is a little bit strange. I ended up playing around with the temperatures a whole lot, um, and wasn't able to cure the problem pretty much ever. You can even see down here, I used some metal tile to try to heat up the solids and whatnot. Didn't work. Nothing I tried worked to get rid of those solids. Now, I even went as far as to use an auto sweeper to load up a conveyor loader and kind of ship that thing around to try to heat up the solids that are running through that in order to turn that into a gas. Now, while that could be achieved every now and then, it wasn't really all that consistent. Unfortunately, the mass inside of here just was sometimes a little bit too much. And ultimately, it was kind of easy to get this thing to back up. And then once it was backed up, it was not really all that easy to get it to clear. Unfortunately, I don't have a save that shows this working, but ultimately this experiment right here solved the problem of having solid methane. For whatever reason, when the gas comes off of one of these tiles right here, it no longer is in contact with it, so therefore it only goes to a liquid and doesn't actually go to a solid. And that's really, really weird. But I guess it kind of makes sense because if you have several of these pipes lined up like this, one, two, three, four, all the way down, as that liquid drops down there, it could potentially uh, go across to yet another very, very cold pipe and at that point drop the temperature even more, ultimately ending up a solid at the very bottom. Whereas this, once it kind of comes in contact with the metal tile, it falls away and then down here it's in a vacuum. So it no longer has the ability to get any colder. So using the learnings from my previously failed test right here, I ended up using a counterflow system right here in order to make the metal tiles here as cold as possible at the bottom and then it warms up near the top. And what you can see here is that this gas, depending on how vigorous it is at the moment, will actually comb its way up or down depending on how, how cold it needs to be. So you can see right where the sulfur is forming right here and right where the sour gas becomes, you know, you can see sour gas there and then it's a vacuum right there. And as we let this run a little bit more, you can actually see this kind of move up and down depending on, on what my settings are up here. You can also see that these things are running like crazy, which is absolutely awesome because we're generating a lot of power uh, or a lot of 
a lot of sour gas because we're using a lot of power to create that temperature difference because all of those aqua tuners are running. So every once in a while, I do get a little bit of ore down there. You can see that it's only 13.6 and this over the very, very long run uh, hasn't really gone up to some humongous number. Like you see sulfur down there with tons and tons of it. In the previous setups, that's what we would have seen down here with both materials. So while you can only see it there for a fraction of a second, you can see that the methane is at negative 168.7 degrees Celsius, which is exactly where it should be because you have to get the temperature five degrees beyond its transition point in order for the game to even take it into effect. And what we can see down here is that I'm also using space heaters. I just kind of put more of them down there. And that works well enough in order to convert this into a gas, which is then running out to power an enormous amount of natural gas generators. So you can see here, yeah, this is actually combing its way up a little bit. It might go up a little bit further if I just let it run a little, a little bit more. It's kind of hovering right here, which is pretty much exactly what I want to see. Now there's a lot of method to this madness that's going on here. I'm only using radiant pipes that are behind this metal tile right here. So I just build the metal uh, radiant pipes right in that spot. Everything else here is insulated so that it doesn't interact with the liquid that's falling past it. The other important thing here is that this is only too wide, so therefore the gas is always in contact with the metal tile and never flanked by two chunks of gases on the side. So that's a pattern that could potentially be, you know, expanded for even more powerful systems. Not that this one's lacking any amount of power, as we'll see here once I get into the, the reports. If you talk about the automation, it's actually pretty simple uh, as compared to what it was beforehand. So this is set to be below 650 degrees Celsius. So if we ever get above that, then I'm actually just going to turn the aqua tuners off. Otherwise, they're just gonna run like crazy. I only ever enable the steam turbines if it gets above 565 degrees. Again, that's above the transition temperature of the petroleum so that we are flashing that into sour gas very, very quickly. But at the same time, we're not also, we're, we're not letting it get super hot, which could also potentially flash more sour gas than we can handle. Um, and it could drive sour gas all the way to the bottom down here. And once you saturate the bottom area down here, this thing just doesn't like it. You need to have more cooling capacity than the amount of heat you're putting in. So. To make that happen, we have to run the steam turbines every once in a while to kind of delete a little bit of the energy out from the top side here in order to maintain a happy balance between the two areas. So when we take a look at the temperature, it, it, it couldn't be more drastic. So up top here, we have this ridiculous 500 and something degrees Celsius, and that is right here. And then all of a sudden, boom, it drops down to negative 137 degrees Celsius, and then it's, it's liquid by the time it gets right here. So the temperature difference is absolutely huge. And surprising enough, it really isn't inefficient at all. Remember, the thing that we're comparing this to is the use of pumps in order to pump the sour gas into a cooling chamber. So when you have seven pumps running continuous throughout the entire day right there, that's a thousand kilowatts that we could potentially be saving, which is a pretty, you know, pretty awesome. So let's take a look at the reports here and just kind of compare the previous system to what we have now. So the old system here was using 4,728 kilojoules a day in order to get 8,100 out. So this system right here, as it's being tested right now, has a little additional crude oil that's being run in, so you're not going to see it right exactly it. However, here's what the numbers are uh, on average, which I kind of took from this point outward. And what we can see here is that we got a better percentage difference between the two. So we actually have improved from the previous setup to what we have now. So instead of 63 to 37%, we're now 70% to 30. So that was a 7% improvement by just removing all of those pumps. You can also see that this unit back here is actually running at a higher rate. And that's because I'm just pumping in as much crude oil as I possibly can which is going beyond the capacity of our oil well. So I'm actually using a little bit of extra oil over here just to fill in the gaps. This is probably the best deal on the internet. You can help support my channel by saving money for absolutely free if you use Honey to save money when shopping online. In this example here, you can see how Honey found a better deal for the exact same item, potentially saving me $1.75. On Amazon, I like to save items for later to see when they become discounted. Honey makes this easy because I can see the recent price changes and then set up a notification that lets me know when it drops below my desired amount. You can see here several transactions from a previous purchase from AliExpress that will later save me $10. Honey is a completely free browser extension that is super easy to set up, 
And if you use my link in the description below, that's how you're going to help support my channel. Thank you guys so much for your time. Stay awesome. Now, you didn't think I was actually going to leave you there. I did continue to run this thing, but only using the oil well here, disabling the, any of the auxiliary oil that I was pumping into this thing. So I ran that, and here's the results. So this right here has a 68% out to 38% consumed right there, which is actually a little bit less because uh, I think just that oil well and kind of how it operates, or I don't know, it could be just about anything. But you can see here that we're able to get 12,300 uh, kilojoules being produced here, and we get 8,445 out. Now, when we compare that to the last one, we're still getting just about the same amount of power out. Uh, this one's 8,110 versus, you know, 8,400. However, the amount used is actually quite a bit less. So you can see here, this is 4,728 that is being used up per cycle right there as compared to 3,900. So we're saving 800 kilojoules per cycle, which is pretty darn close to the 1,000 we could potentially be saving. Now there are some definite big differences between the two setups because these over here are not generating anywhere near the amount of heat that they were last time. So we're actually getting a lot of power um, in the old system back via these steam turbines. However, I have not, progressed this setup here far enough to actually make that happen. So this is still coming out at negative 140 degrees Celsius. The next logical setup for this system here is to use this natural gas to pre-cool the sour gas before it gets to my radiator system that's running off of the aqua tuners up here. That way I could potentially improve the efficiency even more than what I have over here and also increase the thermal capacity for this entire setup right here so I could potentially get a lot more out of this amount of aqua tuners up top. So what's the main takeaway from this? Well, personally, I think it has to do with perseverance and the fact that sometimes you need to delete and try again because I deleted and tried again many, many different times here. And I think that's just an important thing to get into, especially if you're designing things um, that are just new, you haven't ever done before. Obviously things don't necessarily work the first time and rather than getting frustrated, I think you need to take from, learn from your failures. And in this case, I used the things that didn't work in order to build something that ultimately did work. And I think in the long run is going to work better. So hopefully that's a little bit inspiring to you guys. So there we have it. Yes, we've managed to get even more power out of this oil well. And you know what? It looks like there's still potential for quite a bit more. If you have some other ideas for me, you know where to leave those. And if this looks like the channel for you, maybe consider that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, guys. Have a great day. Stay awesome. Peace. Brothgar, out.